right? And this fundamental process that's happening in governing our ability to exist on the Earth, right? Life on Earth, which is CO2 assimilation. So we went through the Calvin cycle for C3 plants, and you had the three CO2 coming in, and you have this ribulus 1,5 bisphosphate that's uh, regenerated and cycling. And so here, right, you end up getting, um, for every one CO2, right, you'll have two, three phosphoglycerates that are made. So when you're practicing this, just go over the numbers, right, in terms of the carbons. So, right, these are um, three carbon compounds, and so you'll have one carbon coming in from CO2, one carbon coming in from the C5 compound to get six carbons, which is two, three carbon. Right, three carbon compounds. And then from there, um, we move through the cycle, um, and then we end up having this, the glycerolohydride phosphate and DHAP, one of which is pulled off and the rest recycles. So part of this, we talked about the energetics, and we're gonna be talking about that more today, where you have, um, two ATP for every CO2 coming in, so one ATP per reaction with the three PGA. So for every one CO2, you get two, three PGA, and you need two ATPs. So you can go back and look at that reaction if you need to. Um, by this point, right, they've been condensed into one molecule that's five carbons, and so it's only one ATP that's coming in per CO2. So there's three of these, right, as opposed to six of these. And you have one ATP coming in. So for every cycle, you're basically, um, if you were looking at this as one CO2, right, it would be three ATP coming in. And I'm not meaning to ignore NADPH. Um, we are not gonna be focusing on that right now, but make sure you do know that as well, right? So that's gonna be six NADPH. So what we started to talk about last time, but we went pretty quickly, was this idea of photorespiration. So we have Rubisco, right, catalyzing this reaction where CO2 comes in and then forms these two 3-BGA. However, Rubisco also has an oxygenase activity. So it can also use oxygen, and it has to do with its evolution. It evolved when there was basically no oxygen in the atmosphere, so it didn't have to worry about using CO2 versus oxygen as a substrate. And so this process where Rubisco is actually using oxygen as a substrate is called photorespiration. So typically, right, with the carboxylase, you get the two, three PGA, and that continues on the cycle. But with the oxygenase, which happens, we're just gonna say once every four times, it's like three to four times, it's temperature dependent, so at standard conditions, we're gonna say four times, you get one three phosphoglycerate, that one can keep going on, normal cycle, but you get this other product which cannot be used. So in this case, you have to convert this phosphoglycolate, also called glycolate, um, just for short, uh, into three PGA that can be used in this cycle. And the way they do it, plants do this, is through glycolate recycling or photorespiration. So right here, when oxygen comes in, right, you, you have one, so you have ribulus 1,5-bisphosphate plus O2, so this is Rubisco catalyzing this again. This is C3 plant, you get three PGA, and you get this product that you have to convert called glycolate. So you go through this whole pathway to be able to make it into three PGA, which you can use. And when you use this pathway, you don't end up using up um, uh, NADH, because here you generate it, here you use it, but you do use ATPs. So you use one extra ATP whenever you do this cycle. And this is actually per, so this is what I think can get confusing for you guys, so we're gonna walk through the numbers. 
This is per two phosphoglycolates. So for every two, you end up using one ATP to make three phosphoglycerin. So if we start looking at the cost, um, the cost that is in your book and that you're told about, right, if our C3 plant is three ATPs per CO2, and that comes from here, right? One, two, three ATPs per CO2. But once every four cycles, Rubisco is using oxygen. So when it does that, it gets one three PGA and one phosphoglycolate. And then for every two phosphoglycolate, you have to recycle to make one three PGA. So if I gave you like these types of pathways, you should be able to do these kinds of calculations, but you also want to know these take-home messages here. So you don't have to memorize this entire pathway, but you have to know the energetics of it, right? That that is put in and that's released. We're going to talk about that right here. So for every two phosphoglycolate, you recycle to make one 3PGA, which can go back into um, the Calvin cycle, you use one ATP and release one CO2, right? So you're using one ATP. So to convert this into this, which is in the Calvin cycle, you need to, you release one CO2 and you put in one ATP, that's extra. You're still using the, the ATPs that you usually use to go around. So you end up having a cost of three and a half ATPs per oxygenase reaction, and you release one half CO2. And that's because for every oxygenase reaction, you get one 3PGA and one phosphoglycolate, but then this cycle uses two, so I instead of um, counting it as one ATP, I count it as a half ATP, and instead of counting it as one CO2, I count it as a half. So now, right, if we add this all up, so for four cycles of Rubisco, the carbolo carboxylase part is three ATPs per CO2, the oxygenase part is three and a half ATPs, and you lose a half a CO2. So for four cycles, right, you use up three cycles times three ATP per CO2 plus one cycle of the oxygenase times 3.5 ATP per CO2. So you're using up 12.5 ATP and you're releasing a half CO2. So the total, so I would give you, right, like the pathway in this case, and you would need to calculate what's going on. So the total then ends up being 12.5 ATP divided by three, right, for the carboxylase carboxylase minus 0.5 for the photorespiration, which is 12.5 divided by 2.5, or 5 ATP per CO2. So typically when you're seeing this in textbooks, it's, it actually, they almost always mention photorespiration and that it's a cost, but then they never actually do it out for you. So as the temperature rises, you have more of these oxygenase cycles. It could even be one for one. And so in that case, right, your cost is getting higher and higher and higher in terms of the ATP per CO2 because you're losing CO2 for every two times you use the cycle and you're putting in an extra ATP for every two times you do the cycle. So now I think you can see why plants that evolve in tropical areas, um, like the C4 plants, actually came up with a solution to get around this problem because they typically are in higher temperature areas. Yeah. I just want to clarify, is the oxygenase activity, is it the total mistake by the plant or do they actually get anything out of it? Do they not want to do it at all as they come over? Yeah, they're not getting anything out of it. There could be extreme conditions, but yeah, for the purpose of the class, no. So when we talk about C4 photosynthesis, it's essentially eliminating photorespiration. And so 
The types of plants are like corn, sugar cane, tropical glass, grasses. So these evolved in actually very um, humid and also um, high temperature locations. And again, this high temperature, you would have more of the oxygenase activity, and so this would be favored. And in this case, what happens, right, is that you don't have rubisco in the cytosol. You have it, um, you don't have it in this uh, mesophyll cell, sorry, you have it in a secondary cell called the bundle sheet. And this enzyme PEP carboxylase uses the CO2. It does not have oxygenase activity, can't use oxygen, only CO2, super high affinity for CO2, so it's basically saturating, um, and it has a very high catalytic rate. Okay, so really increasing CO2 doesn't do that much to help here. This has already been optimized, and then that converts it to malate to use in the bundle sheet cell where Rubisco is, and here Rubisco is taking that CO2 off of malate, and in this case, there's really almost no oxygen here, so there's no competition. I wanted to point out, because I'm not sure that I actually stressed this last time, this is called C4 because the first place where you get fixed carbon is a C4, four carbon compound, right, oxaloacetate. So this energy cost is 5 ATP per CO2 under like standard conditions. So you had your normal 3 ATP per CO2 happening here, and then this extra two, which we talked about last time, that are required for this reaction. And whenever you see ATP to AMP, remember, it's like two hydrolysis, right? Two releases of phosphoryl group. So you can count it as two ATP. So this energy cost makes it Right, much more similar to the C3 cost when you actually take photorespiration into account. And then as temperature increases, right, this oxygenase activity is even higher, and so you really would favor C4s, and that's why C4 plants evolve in temperature, um, high temperature areas. And then we discussed the eye clicker quiz, but now I've gone over the details, and again, this will all be posted again um, after lecture. So for CO2 increase, that helps the C3 plant. They'll get more cycles with CO2 rather than oxygen. But for the C4, the PEP carboxylase is already saturated. Oxygen is not competing. Okay, we'll talk about this with each one. We did not cover camp plants. So now I wanted to move on to the metabolism um, review of kind of what of everything for the exam. So I'm not really reviewing everything for the exam, of course. Um, I, that would never work because it's been all these lectures. But I'm just going to give you some ideas and themes. So first of all, the exam is 90 points. The eye clickers were 10. I'll have all of that eye clicker data um, uploaded and fixed if it needs to be um, this weekend, so you can look at it. So. You had the review last night with your GSIs. I still have office hours Monday, four to six. And then if you, I'll post this and I'll make an announcement, but you're also welcome to write down the location of where you'll be taking the exam on Tuesday. And for DSP students, you'll be starting at 6.30. No calculators, phones have to be put away, no headphones, and we treat the honor code very seriously. Um, so, uh, yeah. You don't want to, I know you won't, so. But it, it is serious, we actually do randomly copy exams and do that kind of thing just as a backup. So looking at our sections, right, we talked about bioenergetics, glycolysis, a lot around glucose, right, gluconeogenesis, regeneration, the pentose phosphate pathway. We talked about um, how you store glucose, right, as glycogen, citric acid cycle, how you can con finally convert Right, glucose all the way down to CO2 um, with the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. Fatty acid metabolism. We're going to look quickly at um, each one of these the ketone bodies and synthesis, which we didn't do much on synthesis, a little bit on amino acids and urea, and photophosphorylation and CO2 fixation like plants. So, the eye clicker question today. For my information, is what was your favorite topic? I know there were others, but I only had these choices. Five minutes.
I'm gonna go with B. I like B. Nobody likes it. I like B. But I promise this, we got to memorize so much. Yeah. You're going to post this, right? Yeah. I'm going to delete it because I'm out of memory. <laughs> <laughs> If I were to retake this class in the fall, I would only retake it if it was her. Like teaching it too again. Then the calendar would be. <laughs> but now I'm ready. Because now I know he doesn't teach.
Um, covalent modification, we talked a lot about phosphorylation, so it's actually modifying that serine group. Um, usually it's the serine that's modified. We also talked about carbomyl carbomylation with the CO2. So there are lots of different ways that you can modify the um, enzyme in terms of its activity. Right, this one, allosteric product and feedback inhibition, those are not covalent modifications. Right. They're binding to a site on the protein, but they're not binding to an amino acid um, and covalent, you know, with a covalent modification. Okay. Only phosphorylation and carbonylation are doing that that we discussed. Substrate availability, right? So whenever you're calculating those delta Gs, how much of the substrate is there versus how much of the product? If you have a lot of substrate, it'll push it forward. If you have a lot of product, that's usually inhibiting the process. Channeling removes that product from one, gives it right to the next one. We talked about that. We talked about the different types of channeling. It can be in the enzyme, or it can be an arm, like the lipoase arm that's transferring it, or the um, sulfhydryl groups on the fatty acids in phase one. Um, and then you can also have um, product inhibition, which I talked about up here. We just recently touched on a new area, which was the pH and magnesium, but I think that has to do with chloroplast enzymes, where you get that change with light. And I think, though, that this builds on work that you did in the first part of the course. Right? So, other themes were pathway regulation, compartmentalization. Right? There were shuttles and transporters to be able to move certain things, for example, from the cytosol to the mitochondrial matrix. Um, often from one tissue to another, you have to convert it into a form that can be moved through the bloodstream. Um, so you want to really think about that as a theme. Often we had isozymes of an enzyme with different affinity to the substrate or different regulation of different tissue. So you can think about like the hexaprenase. Um, and how you actually had different affinity for glucose in the one that's um, in one tissue versus another. You also have different regulation of hexaprenase in one tissue versus another. So this is often a common theme. Um, irreversible steps are regulated, highly regulated. Common regulatory um, molecules couple the status of the cell to the enzyme activity. So that could be ATP, that could be NAD. We had a number of cases, you don't have to memorize this part, but in bacteria, they would be separate enzymes, and then in the eukaryotes, it's one enzyme with all those different things. So you can think about, for example, the fatty acid synthesis, fast one. So big picture themes, chemical logic. So again, energetics we stress, coupling uh, reaction with ATP to actually make it thermodynamically favorable. <coughs> Usually the entry into the pathway is highly regulated. That entry can be that very first catalytic step, or it can be the step that actually transports it in, right? Um, irreversible steps always differ if you're making something or degrading it. Um, you often need to activate a substrate, like for example with CoA, to then make it um, more reactive chemically, um, so to make either better uh, nucleophile or leaky group. Um, how do you cleave a six carbon sugar into two, three carbon sugars? So those are part of the reactions you really need to know, and that strategy. Um, and then also the regeneration, which we we'll just want to know the basic strategy of the regeneration. So application questions, again, um, your, the practice exam, the book problems are useful for these. So on the practice exam, how many people have already done the practice exam? 
It's okay. I mean, honestly, um, it's probably good to study a lot before you do it, so it can be the best reflection of whether you know it. So, um, so it'll be useful for you. So basically, um, on the exam, on the practice exam, I have a question about the beetle cycle. So sorry to spoil that, but I'm not telling you what. So you could. So what I'm trying to tell you is these are applications. So we talked about a few beetle cycles. Um, and how often they're not occurring, right, in animals, and there's all these ways to control them, but I could give you reactions that would make a few dial cycle using reactions you would know, and then you would have to draw the cycle, okay? Um, so you also could have like a new pathway that you need to draw, again, only using reactions that you know that I told you you needed to know, okay? Um, and it would be something that we didn't study, like it could be something in bacteria, but using specific reactions that you already know. And then um, you could think about how you would confirm this experimentally, like using a radial label, like the Calvin cycle, right, where you have the 14 carbon um, on the CO2. And if something's channeled, right, you're not going to see that product because it will be converted to the next thing and it'll never leave the enzyme. So that's just something to think about. Um, you could be given reduction potentials in a hypothetical electron transport chain. You have to order them in terms of the donor's acceptors, and then I could give you information about inhibitors, and you would talk about what you would use them, how you would use them to confirm the order. You could be get a, given a set of reactions in the novel pathway with the delta Gs, and you'd figure out the steps that would be highly regulated, and maybe even, depending on the information I give you, um, postulate mechanisms. So those are the kinds of, just in a few examples, yeah. Yeah, so if I'm giving you a pathway that's synthesizing something, you might postulate that an irreversible step could be feedback inhibited by the end product, something like that. So if it's something I make up, it, your postulation just has to have a rationale for it, right? So memorization, right, that's just part of it. Um, but they also require understanding. So again, the practice exam gives you examples, your GSIs have been giving you examples, and the iClicker gets it, like um, the understanding, what you would need to know. So I would just be reviewing all of these, go back to the book if there's something you don't understand. And I'll have different levels of difficulty, just like you will see on the practice exam. So there'll be some that are more complex memorization, like based on memorization, and others that are pretty straightforward. So all of these um, I go through in the study aids, but just to show you again, for free energy reduction potential, you do need to know these equations. And you'll always be given the constants, and you don't need a count, you won't be using calculators, so they'll be simple numbers. So for each lecture, uh, yeah? Uh, on the practice exam, I think you give us one of the bioenergetic formulas, but not the others. Would you provide that one on the exam, or would you provide different ones? Or so it's right here. I'm sorry. So I have not changed these. These were the same. I'll tell you the few where I did um, that were in the reader and after the full lecture. So right, this tells you what you need to know. So how to calculate delta G prime if given K equilibrium, right? That means you need to know that formula. How to calculate delta G prime if given concentrations of reactions, right? That's the relationship between this and this. How to calculate delta G prime if given, delta, if given E zero, right? You get both reactions, so you would calculate the delta E and then you plug it in. And then the one thing I do want you to know is because it's really important reference point is this Delta G for ATP of 30.5. And I'll, I'll also make an announcement in case there's anyone that um, didn't get that. So for number two, these are for lectures two and three. Uh, basically, it's um, here, right, these first lectures you really needed to know every part of those pathways. The formulas, the enzymes, the reactions. Um, you don't have to memorize, right? I really detail this. You don't have to memorize the free energy of the individuals, but you have to know overall. Um, and then, again, um, why you bypass these specific ones and which enzymes are bypassed, the purpose. I mean, really, I'm going through the details of exactly what you need to know here. Okay. <coughs>
<laughs> so for four and five, um, the glucose and glycogen, I did not emphasize regulation and control. I will not ask you those terms. I just don't, I think they can be a little bit misleading the way they're discussed in the book. Um, and then I did not emphasize um, glycogen synthesis. So you do need to know the controls between, like when is glycogen made and when is it not made, but you don't need to know all those details about glycogen synthesis. We talked about it too quickly and did not stress it. So those two, right? Um, for the citric acid cycle, um, the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, you really do need, again, central, right, central metabolism, you need to know every part of that. Um, but here, when we talk about it going to these different precursors where you can cool off the intermediates, we just showed that really fast, right? It was like, hey, they can get pulled off, and then you need to put something back in, right, to get that, to continue with the TCA cycle. So you do need to have a feeling for how we replenish it, which we did focus on, but not exactly what's going where. So if I asked you a question, I would show you, oh, something's being pulled off to here, how would we replenish, right, the cycle? For um, the oxidative phosphorylation, everything is here in terms of what you need to know. Um, and um, so just make sure that you can again do these delta Bs and delta Gs. Fatty acids, there was a part that we did not do, right? So we did not talk about the dioxalate cycle. So that I had put do not need to know gray, and I got rid of the reading on that part. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you also, for fatty acids, you need to know glycerol, the energy yield, fatty acid, unsaturated and monosaturated, but I'm not gonna do poly unsaturated because we didn't spend time going through that, and it's not listed here. Oh, I did change one thing here. Um, and I already changed it when I posted the slides. Enzymatic steps of fatty acid biosynthesis, I just clarified it is all. Do not need to know specific names of the enzyme domains and that's why. So you need to know basically like how is it activated and what's the basics of what's going on, but you don't have to memorize those domains of each part of the reaction. Um, here, the nitrogen <laughs> cycle is just for context. Right? So we did the one part of it you'd want to know besides what we talk about is the one that I had the slides on for um, uh, the symbiotic, symbiotic nitrogen fixation, but you don't have to memorize that whole cycle, right? which is giving us a context. Um, and then here for the urea cycle, you don't have to memorize every reaction, but you need to know the overall cycle. We skipped um, essential amino acids and some of the amino acid um, part here, and so again, if that was skipped, you don't need to know it, and that again was all put after the slide level lecture. For oxidative, um, for photophosphorylation, we have the basics here, and then obviously comparing it with oxidative phosphorylation. And then for carbohydrate synthesis, um, I just uh, put in gray, you don't need to know camp plants, because we didn't, and I'll post again what we went over today, just to emphasize that photo exploration and C3 versus C4 to really understand it. So the point of what I'm telling you is really for you to know these fundamentals, refer to the study aids, um, and also to think about the big picture themes that I've been trying to stress. We've been really fortunate to have great GSIs this semester. I'm really thankful for them, all the work that they've done, and just how um, really like talented and strong they are, right? And kind, kind as well. So finally, I just want to again, I wish you on the first day good luck, and I want to again wish you good luck on the test. Please sleep. Right? Like you have to be able to think on the exam. I really do want you to sleep before the exam. And then the last thing, you have like 10 minutes, is um, it's really important to do the evaluation in the class.